is one very much of mutual benefit. The honourable member for Cunningham. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question again is to the Minister for Small Business and Consumer Affairs. Has the minister made any approach to or had contact with any director of Coles Meyer or with Western Australian planning ministers, both past or present, or their departments, in regard to any business in which he has a financial interest? The Honourable Minister for Small Business and Consumer minister. Affairs. The Minister will resume his seat. The Honourable Member for North Sydney on a point of order. Mr Speaker, I, I fail to see how that's related to the ministerial responsibility of the minister. It's a specific question about his personal interests and is unrelated to his ministerial responsibilities. I uphold the point of order. The question is out of order. The Honourable Member for Aston. Mr Speaker. The question is that the motion be agreed to. All those in favour, say no. no, 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 no. Mr. Speaker, we have. Uh, no, no, no. We'll give them. Mr. Speaker, I move that this House dissents from the Speaker's uh, ruling. Did you get, did you get that right? Speaker's ruling. You'll do anything to protect him. Mr Speaker, there is no more important function performed by this chamber than it holds ministers accountable. That is absolutely the central feature of this question time process. Absolutely the central feature of this question time process. The question that was just asked of this minister goes to business relationships that he conducts at the point of time that he happens to be a minister. That is what the question was about. It dealt with the minister's uh, position as far as uh, his business involvements were concerned in relation to those three shopping centres, which he has manifestly, and I would say too, in breach of the standing orders of this place and the requirements of this place, manifestly refused or failed to place within his register of interests. And that's another matter that this House will have to deal with, I believe, at some point of time. But what is, uh, and perhaps it would have been a bit easier to deal with it now in question to this, in regard to this dissent from your ruling, had there been an honest return from this minister in this statement of his interests uh, in this place. Because had there been an honest return from this minister, there could have been no question that this was front and centre within the rights of this House, members' rights in this House, to ask ministers, the minister question about, questions about his situation. Now, the guide or the code of conduct which every minister signs up to in this place, which uh, is honoured more in the breach these days than it is in the undertaking, but as the Prime Minister admitted, was a code of, a code of conduct which was effectively replicated while we were in office and for ministers subsequent prior to our, appoint, uh, our, our appointment to government, requires that, among other things, a minister shall not conduct the affairs of his businesses. Uh, when he happens to hold a ministerial position. Right. And it, is, it is not just a question of appearance, it is also a question of absolute propriety. But appearance is important in that regard as well. But when you go over from <coughs> simply the statement of whether or not those interests do exist to active promotion of business concerns as far as, the, uh, as, as far as the minister's portfolio is concerned, you are getting right at the heart, right at the heart of whether or not disinterested government is run in this country, whether or not disinterested government. How can it possibly not be relevant? How can it possibly not be relevant for the Minister for Small Business Affairs, who is conducting the, uh, an inquiry into both the situation of people with franchises and also the situation of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, people in tenancies and the po possibilities of oppressive conduct, who has answered an array of questions in this House on this, that place, who has referred those matters to a parliamentary committee, who has had a report on those matters, who is handling those matters for the government, and he had just responded earlier on, I might say, to a question on uh, uh, the c conduct in relation to franchisees, conduct in relation to franchisees, that he was still responsible for the development of government policy in that matter, even though in regard to the question of oppressive conduct in relation to tenants, he is, while he is developing the policy, evidently the Prime Minister, evidently the Prime Minister has removed 
uh, that particular uh, uh, authority from him. And, uh, he now finds himself in a situation where he has a question directed to the heart of his propriety on this. Has he conducted with the West Australian government, indirectly or directly, in, uh, verbally or in writing, uh, a uh, lobbying or pressure or whatever on behalf of his business interests? Has he had any discussions with a director of the Colesmeyer board in relation to uh, any of the, uh, uh, the tenancies uh, in in, uh, uh, for, his, uh, for his particular holdings? And you rule that matter out of order. Frankly, Mr Speaker, there is no logic in that ruling. None. If there is logic in that ruling, Mr Speaker, then this House cannot query ministers as the propriety of their That's conduct right. yeah, yeah. on anything. Yeah. On anything at all. And let me just go through, because I, because I had not had before me, not having for, the, for one minute, for one minute expected that I'd have to stand in this place and challenge a Speaker's ruling on this matter. For one minute I didn't actually have the code of conduct with me. But let me, uh, let me read, this, uh, read this out. Ministers are required to resign directorships in uh, public companies and may retain directorships in private, com private companies only if such company operates, for example, a family farm, business or portfolio of, of, of investments, and if retention of the directorship is not likely to conflict with the minister's duty. Uh, ministers uh, uh, must uh, not accept retainers. Ministers must be honest in their dealings and must not mislead. Ministers are required to divest themselves of all shares and similar interests in any company or business involved in the area of their portfolio or responsibilities. The transfer of interest to a family member or to a nominee of trust is not acceptable. Uh, ministers should not exercise any influence obtained from their public office or use official information to obtain any improper benefit for themselves or another. I mean, it goes on and on. Ministers must, uh, should not accept any benefit where acceptance uh, uh, might give an appearance that they should be subject to improper inf influence. Uh, ministers are required to make statements of interest in accordance with the arrangements determined by the Prime Minister. The, uh, and, uh, and every single one of these has, in one way or another, Every single one of these has, in one way or another, been breached by this minister at some point of time in the course of the last year. And, what he's supposed to be and to come for. down to a position now where it is not possible to question this minister on the conduct of his portfolio and the relationship of the conduct of his portfolio to his private business interests denies any validity to the role of this parliament in holding accountable a minister both for his standards and for the conduct of his portfolio. Now, I never expected to get up and have to get up in this place and rule a dissent from your ruling, because I never expected that we would have a situation <coughs> here where you have upheld standards in this place and have tried your very best to uphold standards would so comprehensively collapse at the barrier. Would so comprehensively collapse at the barrier. And uh, I do think, Mr Speaker, that you ought to think about this ruling very carefully. I don't know why you arrived at this conclusion, having, persist having permitted a whole series of questions which went to precisely this. What particular error in your hearing or whatever that there was in regard to what was put to you by, um, uh, by the member for Cunningham? But, uh, and I, I might read out one other of these particular standards, because this absolutely absolutely goes to the heart of this. Ministers, this and subsequent references to ministers should be read as including parliamentary secretaries, must not engage in any professional practice or in the daily work of any business. And I stress that. Or in the daily work of any business. The central guideline. They must not engage in any professional practice or in the daily work of any business. Now, Mr Speaker, if the minister has had discussions in relation to tenancies in his shopping centres, if he has had discussions in relation to them, if he has approached directors who have in their control some capacity to determine whether or not somebody will take up a tenancy, if he has approached a state government with regard to any planning authorities that are associated with uh, his business activities, if he is handling on a routine basis 
employment issues that pass across his desk. And I remind you that earlier on a question was asked on that in which he in fact openly said that he is handling those employment, uh, uh, employment considerations. There can be simply no question, no question at all, that what the minister is doing is engaging in the daily work of his business. What else is the daily work of a business of a person who owns shopping centres, other than the question of who tenants the place, uh, the terms and conditions in which those tenants go in, the terms and conditions laid down for the expansion or development of those places, the terms and conditions that are associated with the employees, what is daily work? What is daily work if that is not daily work associated yeah. with a business? Yeah. And what does pri proprietorial standards mean in this place if there is no relationship between, or no capacity to identify a relationship between decisions being taken by a minister and the business practices of that minister. No, that daily activity, that daily activity I might, uh, 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 that I refer to, of course, uh, would preclude the minister from involvement, no matter what his portfolio was. That is a prohibition, not simply against a minister's role as a minister and what his business interests might be. So it would not be, if that were going on, it would not be required of us as an opposition to establish, in fact, a direct relationship between the two. It would not be required of us to do so. In this case, of course, we can. In this case, we can because the ministerial portfolio covers the sorts of business arrangements that he is directly engaged in his daily work. Were he to be the Treasurer, were he to be the Attorney-General, were he to be the Minister for Defence, it would still be possible for us to question him in this regard, because this prohibition doesn't simply go to direct relationships to the minister's duties. It also it goes to the activities of a minister generally. But in this particular instance, it does go. So it is doubly culpable, culpable of the minister, doubly culpable of the minister, that he should confront this issue, and that he should be asked, uh, and he should be capable of being questioned by, about it. And if you rule that out in this place, Mr. Speaker, uh, then, there is a, uh, then there is a deal of trouble for all of us. Now, the Prime Minister frequently defends his positions now in, in words that uh, I remember Charlie Court once saying that uh, he didn't want a minister to have the seat out of his pants. The Prime Minister says further it's a good thing for him to have uh, uh, ministers in this place who have had business interests and the experience. Member for Burke. I would not dispute that. I don't think it's a bad thing at all that members of this, of this House should have had business experience. Uh, but there is a point of time when choices have to be made. When you become a minister, choices have to be made. You either make a decision that you are going to be able to uphold your ministerial duties to the highest standards that are imposed upon you, or you're going to do something else. These are issues that ministers have to con confront continually. Sometimes the appropriate response of a minister is to absent himself from cabinet if there's a clash, and a clash that is not likely to be regular. Sometimes there's a necessity to hand the responsibility for a particular portfolio's conduct over to another minister on a narrow area of, uh, of that minister's position. But sometimes it's necessary for a minister to make a choice and to decide that he will either divest himself or put himself at, at demonstrable arm's length from a particular activity, demonstrable arm's length, if he is going to be able to do his affairs appropriately. But one thing a minister cannot do under any circumstances, on, these, on a, reading, a proper reading of these particular uh, circumstances, one thing that minister cannot do under any circumstances at all, and this is not a question of standing aside from a particular decision every now and then. One thing a minister cannot do under any circumstances is engage in any professional practice or in the daily work of any business. The daily work of any business. Now, I know, Mr Speaker, that you would have trouble discerning what the government's intentions are in regard to the operation of the Code of Conduct. And this would be, to some extent, mitigating in your, uh, what we believe to be an incorrect ruling, because this government has absolutely no standards when it comes to enforcing its standards. This government has, uh, has run away, 
has run away from it repeatedly when questioned in this place, and it has to be said that the, these ministerial standards remain under review 15 months after this government has been appointed. We still do not have them finalised. But nevertheless, the Prime Minister made clear that why, why he nevertheless, while they are nevertheless going down the road of, um, the, of uh, revising those ministerial standards, these ministerial standards would continue to apply. And, uh, Mr. Speaker, so they should. And I can recollect, Mr. Speaker, and I've actually had the numbers uh, asked of him. That when the Prime Minister, when the Prime Minister, the former Prime Minister, Mr Keating, was on the other side of the chamber and in this place, he was subject to 14 questions in relation to his priggery from Hewson, McLaughlin and all at, those, uh, at that particular point of time. Not one of them ruled out. Not one of those questions ruled out. And not, and the Prime Minister's defence was consistently, insofar as that piggery was concerned, is that he had absolutely no contact absolutely. with the day-to-day -day conduct of that exactly. business. No contact whatsoever question with the day-to-day -day conduct of that business. Que and question after question was trying to establish whether or not he had. Questions were asked as to whether or not he had intervened with the New South Wales government in terms of environmental processes that have been put in place. Questions were asked as to whether or not he had intervened with consumer affairs in relation to New South Wales on some other aspects of it. Questions were asked whether or not he had actually tried to influence local authorities in relation to the conduct of his piggery. You will recollect those, Mr Speaker, because you were in chamber when those questions were asked. All of them. All of them asked directly to the Prime Minister at that, uh, at that point of time. Fourteen questions in all, not one ruled out. Fourteen questions. Now, what has been asked of the Minister directly by the uh, member for Cunningham is simply this. Minister, have you had contact with a, uh, a director of Coles Meyer? Have you had contact with uh, any person in the West Australian government related to the conduct of your businesses in Bunbury? It's a simple, pro a simple, question. A simple question that goes to the very heart of his personal accountability. Now, it has to be said. It has to be said that if you did not actually sit down and, uh, if you had had indeed sat down and worked your way through the uh, the particular propositions uh, that are related to his declaration. You could be excused from thinking that maybe this wasn't entirely relevant, but uh, by now I think it should be entirely obvious to you that one of the most misleading documents currently circulating in the uh, chamber at the moment is the Register of Members' Interests, yeah. insofar as it affects uh, the conduct of this particular minister. Yeah, yeah. Where we have three shopping centres and I think also a petrol station, three shopping centres and a petrol station with 80 tenants in those shop shopping centres as described as Bunbury dash various lots. Perhaps it ought to have been a little more accurate if it had been Bunbury, comma, various, comma, lots, full stop. That might have been a more accurate description, but it would still oblige the minister to put those, uh, put those, questions, those positions down. Now, the common way in which this has been handled in the past, the common way in which this has been handled in the past has been for not the value of any particular shareholding to be uh, outlined, not the value of any particular property obtained or, or owned to be outlined, uh, nor necessarily its address, but an accurate description of what is owned. That is what has generally been required, and members conform. They usually say we have uh, a holiday home or a, uh, or a block of flats or, a, uh, or whatever it is. They don't put down Bunbury various lots for three shopping centres. An accurate rendition of this would have been three shopping centres. That would have been an accurate rendition and one petrol station would have been an accurate rendition probably, uh, insofar as we know it thus far, the, uh, of the members' interests. But uh, that has not appeared here. But the fact that it has not appeared here and therefore alerted you as a person who is a diligent student of these particular returns on, uh, on people's interests, as the Speaker must be, a diligent student as the Speaker must be, uh, you by now will have nevertheless have had it firmly revealed to you by us that there is inadequacies here and that there is a potential area of a conflict of interest. Enough of it. 
Enough of it for the Prime Minister at the beginning of this week to take responsibility off him. Off him. To take responsibility off him. The Prime Minister certainly now thinks this is relevant. That's why he took responsibility for one area of presentation to Cabinet off him and handed it to the Minister for Industry and uh, Tourism. Unfortunately, not much of it, just that part that deals with the Cabinet submission uh, process in Cabinet itself. The, de the development of those codes of conduct, however, remain within his hands and have been within his hands up until the beginning of this, uh, and indeed the presentation to Government, up until the beginning of, uh, of this week. And so anything that is historical in that regard is relevant as far as accountability is concerned. And a new front is opened up here now with its responsibilities in relation to franchising arrangements and the potentiality of particular franchisees, both at his petrol station and of course in his shopping centres, to uh, produce for him a conflict of interest in this regard. Mr Speaker, I conclude in this dissent motion, which I move with very great reluctance and considerable surprise. You must, as Speaker, Mr. Speaker, uphold the capacity of this House to query the government and the government's ministers' handling of all aspects of their portfolios. You must, above all, permit this House to be able to query a minister about a clash between personal private interests and ministerial duties. This is the only place in which these queries can be made on behalf of the Australian people. The only place where confidence can be established for the Australian people that they are impartially governed. If the opposition is denied it in this place, it will be a precedent. No opposition has been denied it by before, certainly not by us in 13 years in government, and you should act now to reverse your decision. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I second the motion. Mr Speaker, I have to admit, when uh, this question was actually put to you today, I was somewhat staggered when you ruled it out of order. And uh, perhaps I, along with the member, member for Watson and your good self, would probably be in a better position to know about these sorts of issues, not to forget, of course, the member for Flinders, because, quite frankly, uh, the question that was put here and the reason that we've uh, dissented from your ruling did nothing more than endeavour to elicit questions and answers from the Minister for Small Business about issues which have been the subject of some discussion and concern in this place for a period of time now. And, uh, it struck me as somewhat odd that past history in this parliament, when your predecessors allowed questions on a variety of issues which the Leader of the Opposition has already referred to, that a question of this nature should be <coughs> ruled out. And as the Leader of the Opposition pointed out, at uh, different times during the course of the last parliament, something like 14 questions Mr. Speaker, were allowed to the Prime Minister about his private interests in terms of the piggery, and it could well have been suggested then that it had nothing to do with his ministerial responsibilities and ruled out. But the learned Speaker of the time allowed it to pass. And I'm sure those that are now in government thought it was a great idea at the time. And secondly, of course, we had examples of when the honourable member for Fremantle was under a degree of questioning in the last parliament. The same thing applied when questions were put to her about the Labor Party, nothing to do with her ministerial responsibilities, and again allowed to pass. So, Mr. Speaker, I have to say we find it rather strange that this particular ruling has been handed down. And we do so also, sir, for a number of other reasons. The first is that it has been clearly established, clearly established in this place that the Minister for Small Business has a conflict of interest when it comes to his ownership of property and his responsibility to develop small business policy on behalf of the government. Now, we have ascertained that that is the case from no other source than the fact that the Prime Minister has removed from his responsibility responding to the retail tenancy issues contained in the Fair Trading Committee report. He has been removed from that and John Moore, the Minister for Industry, given that responsibility. Now, we still haven't worked out when it happened because in question time on Monday, the Minister and the Prime Minister in here were still saying that the Minister for Small Business had that responsibility. So by 3.30 that was still the go. By 7.30 that night on the 7.30 report, the Minister for Small Business owned up and said, oh, that's now gone to John Moore, the Minister for Industry. They've taken it off me. 
because there's a conflict of interest. Well, interestingly, of course, Mr. Speaker, and again one of the reasons why we've taken uh, exception to your ruling on the question that was put, is because another area of conflict of interest has been exposed to this minister, and that is in the question of franchises. Because if one looks at the fair trading inquiry again, you see in recommendations in section 3, particularly 3.1, dealing with franchising, it goes directly to his own personal interests, because in his own shopping centres there are franchisees that occupy positions there. Cash converters, uh, chicken treat and farmer jacks— order. The honourable member for Cunningham will resume his seat. Uh, the minister Mr. on a point of order. Well, Mr Speaker, I mean, it is quite clear that on a motion which is to um, dissent from your ruling that the speakers must keep you know within sort of some parameters of that now we we we, we were a mate we were a mate I remained silent in the first presentation which also which also Order. which also Order. strayed but this uh, the honorable member for Cunningham is is clearly well and truly beyond uh, the requirements of a motion of this sort in terms of relevance I thank the, uh, the minister the honorable member for Kalgoorlie on a further point of order Mr. Speaker, it would seem to me that your ruling would. I, I'm, I'm seeking advice because it will influence how I vote. Had the opposition framed their question to ask, had he had any contact while he was a minister, it seemed to me it would have been order. But they didn't, in fact, do that. They asked at any time. Would that, would that actually influence your judgment? The simple answer is yes, uh, but there is no point of order. Uh, I call the. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, again, and, and I go to the simple fact in linking and encourage him to stay. In linking, the why we have dissented, of the why motion. we have dissented from your ruling in respect of that question, is because you have allowed other questions that go to eliciting information from this minister, or at least attempting to elicit information from this minister about his dealings. And the simple fact is, when we put questions to him today about franchising and whether there were an existing franchisees in his own stores and his own shopping centres, he said, I'm complying with the guidelines. And we're dissenting from your view that further questions about franchising, about his private dealings in shopping centres, about whether he has been talking with representatives Coal Myers board or talking to planning ministers in Western Australia to get some advantage for his own business interests in Western Australia really means that you have, sir, taken the right option to rule questions of that nature out of order. And we would simply argue that's not the case. Now, the point that needs to be made again, Mr Speaker, is this. If this minister does not have <coughs> any conflicts of interest, and if you therefore have to subsequently rule further questions to him about his business dealings out of order, why then did the Prime Minister remove him from responsibility in retail tenancy issues? Yeah. And as a, as a logical extension of my question as to whether or not you will continue to permit questions to this minister on other issues, the fact that he does have this interest with, with, uh, with franchising again raises the question about who now, on behalf of the government, will respond to the Fair Trading Inquiry report in terms of those recommendations. And if, in fact, Mr Speaker, this minister is removed, the question then goes, who do we then continue to ask questions of in this place, given the Prime Minister is not here to give us some satisfactory answers? And it goes again to the fact, sir, whether you would rule out those sorts of questions if we address them to the Minister for Industry, Science and Tourism as the Portfolio Minister and has now been given some responsibility, whether we address them to the absent Prime Minister, whether we address them to the acting Prime Minister, because I'm sure he would have an interest in this as well. But the simple fact is, if there was no problem, Mr. Speaker, about this minister and his pecuniary interest declarations and the Prime Minister's code of ministerial conduct, we would not have asked these questions. And we not, would not therefore be in this position where you have ruled one question asked by this side of the parliament out of order. Now, the Leader of the Opposition simply, again, went to some very fundamental but basic points in support as to why you should rever re reverse your ruling on this matter. He went, of course, to the Minister's registration of members' interests and his real estate and, 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 and noting, as we've all seen before, Bunbury various lots. And if this minister is to be believed, if this minister is to be taken seriously by this place and by retail tenants 
and by retailers in Australia and their associations as being dispassionate, as being an advocate on their behalf, why did he not list him here that he was a landlord? Why is it that he's gone out three days after, Mr Speaker? This report was tabled and said in terms of franchising he doesn't agree with any of those recommendations and always wanted voluntary codes. Why is it that this minister in last year's budget cut the funding for the Franchising Code Council? Now, you could ask a few questions like that, just as retailers have been doing. And, uh, uh, Mr. Mr Deputy Speaker, many of these retailers in his own shopping centres have been doing that. They've been asking the questions. We're trying to ask the questions here, and you're knocking them out. One of the questions that one of his own uh, his retailers said, uh, a Mrs. Oh, no, I better not identify, because you know he's a landlord. But uh, uh, he shouldn't be the federal minister for small business and such a major landlord. She was reported to say in the media. We have a number of franchises in our centre, I've named those, and I don't know how Jeff can be making decisions about what happens to franchises either. Well, Mr Speaker, either do we. Either do we. And that's why we are putting questions that go to this minister's direct responsibilities. Now, the other matter, of course, links his hands-on daily work and his hands-on approach to his businesses while still being a minister of the Crown. And the Prime Minister, in bringing down his ministerial guidelines, which, quite frankly, I think the Prime Minister set now so low in terms of the high jump bar that they're not even worth worrying about. These ministers walk through them as if they don't exist. The member for Cunningham will resume his seat. The honourable member for O'Connor. The process of dissent to your ruling relates to the standing orders, not the prime ministerial edict on any matter whatsoever. And it is it is incumbent on those speaking to the dissent motion to do so, pointing out where your ruling has failed the standing orders. And I would draw your attention to 142, where it says. Questions must be maybe put to a minister relating to public affairs, but I would ask that uh, you ask the member to get think, back to uh, the standing. The honourable member for uh, O'Connor, I have uh, encouraged the honourable member for Cunningham to address the specifics of the dissent motion. And Absolutely, I Mr. Speaker. I, I will intend to. I, I intend to do just that. And as I said to you earlier, Mr. Speaker, we are. But, we have a right and a duty in this place to put questions to ministers about their responsibility. We have a right and a duty on behalf of constituents around this country to say to ministers, do you have conflicts of interest? If you do, what does that mean in terms of the Prime Minister's guidelines for ministers? And it means nothing. And if we can't put questions in this place for fear that they are going to be ruled out of order by yourself, then we are indeed in a great deal of trouble. Now, Mr Speaker, we've all seen the editorial in The Australian today where it concludes that this minister should go because there is a conflict of interest. And we have said that. We have established that. And retailers around this country are saying just that. They want us, on their behalf, to put questions to this minister about his dealings on a daily basis. Does he see the tax forms come into his companies? Do those people that are managers of these shopping centres, does that impact on our ability to ask him questions about whether that conflicts with the Prime Minister's code of conduct? And they do. They do. His manager of one of his shopping centres, Colin over there, is reported as having to say, well, you know, I have to go and have a chat to Jeff occasionally to find out what we should do. Now, is that part of the Prime Minister's guidelines for being divorced in a day-to-day -day, day -day basis in looking after shopping centres? And what about the West Australian Retailers Federation Mr. Mr. Uh, Association, Mr Speaker? They want questions asked because what they've said in a letter to the Prime Minister is that given you've already demonstrated your leadership in issues of conflict of interest, integrity and probity, in particular that of the banking vested interest, we so no, see no reason why Minister Prosser should not be treated similarly to his colleague Mr Short. Well, dead right. Mr Short's going to Europe to a banking job. Maybe the Minister for Small Business has to go back to Bunbury to put a full hands-on approach to his own business interests. But, Mr Speaker, the questions that we wish to put in this place and which we wish to put on retail tenancy issues, on the questions of franchising, on the questions of the Minister's hands-on day-to-day 
dealings with his business interests, in the questions of whether or not there has been in, uh, in some way an approach by this minister, now or at some stage when he's had responsibility for small business, about each and every one of his shopping centre developments, whether in the past or proposed. We would like to be able to do that without fear, sir, of you saying to this side of the place they are out of order. And we would ask you to go back and look at, uh, at, look at the Balin book and look at some past history there to get the historic Hansards, look at what was allowed by your predecessors in terms of prime ministers and their, their activities. Look, sir, what happened in the Senate in respect of some senators when they were asked questions about distant related cousins in faraway islands of the South Pacific and whether or not that was ministerial responsibility at the time, and whether those sorts of questions were allowed. Of course they were. But when it's this side of the parliament, when it's the Labor Party asking questions about ministers who have dealings on a day-to-day -day basis, when there is a clear conflict of interest, Mr Speaker, inexplicably, they seem to be ruled out of order. Now, why is this so? We would say to you, sir, it is incumbent upon you, having listened to the argument for the Leader of the Opposition and myself, to reverse your ruling, allow that question to stand, allow the Minister for Small Business and Customs and Consumer Affairs to come to the dispatch box and to tell us once again how he hasn't breached the Prime Minister's guidelines, how he should remain in control of responding to the Fair Trading Inquiry report and why the retailers of Australia should have every confidence in him as a landlord that he'll do the right thing by them. We wait for the answer, Minister. We look forward to that answer, Minister. Here is your opportunity. Don't fob it off to the Leader of the House. Don't fob it off to him. Come to the dispatch box, answer those questions and tell the people out there that you represent that you'll do the right thing by them. The question information be agreed to the Leader of the House. Order. Order. Mr. Speaker, the, uh, uh, the government will oppose Order. the. The member for Watson. Mr. Speaker, the, the government opposes the uh, dissent motion moved by the leader of the opposition. Uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the opposition, quite frankly, they were too quick. Uh, they were too impatient. Mr. Speaker, um, Mr. Speaker, can I remind honourable members? Can I remind honourable members that the question, which is the subject of the dissent motion, was not the first question to the minister today. In fact, it was the fifth question. The fifth question to this minister today. Uh, there was a question from one of the independent members. Uh, he was. Uh, the question was put to him. He answered it. Uh, there were. There were then. There were then three questions. There were then three the questions, Mr. Banks. Speaker, which were put to the uh, member, which were generally on the subject matter, uh, which uh, is now in the dispute. For uh, he answered each and every one of those questions. In fact, Mr. Speaker, in fact, Mr. Speaker, the right honourable member for New England, in fact, rose on a point of order on a claim that one of those questions was out of order, and you ruled the question in order, and you required the minister to answer it. Now, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this is a very technical issue. This is a very technical issue. The question is whether or not the question that was asked was in fact within the uh, requirements of the standing orders. And before I answer that in that in detail, the simple facts are, Mr. Speaker, the simple facts are this: uh, from a practical point of view, you, roll, you ruled the question out of order. If the if the question had then been uh, pr the opportunity to ask a question that would then have gone to the government, and then it would have been the opposition's turn, and they then could have asked a question which I was within order. So this claim, this claim that you know this uh, ruling of yours has prevented them asking questions of the minister is clearly false. One, he's been asked three questions which he answered, and furthermore, he would have he would have been answering further questions on this very issue if only. If only, Mr. Speaker, if only those on the other side, with all the experience of sitting in your seat and running tactics on the other side, had only been smart enough to understand, as the member for Kalgoorlie pointed out to them in his uh, 
uh, in his uh, engaging question to you, as the point he made it to you was, well, if the question had been properly drafted, would you have allowed it to have been asked? And the answer obviously is. Now, Mr. Speaker, uh, so they were just too quick. Too the quick. And as for as uh, I've seen the Leader of the Opposition make many presentations, I'd have to say today's was one of those rather more lacklustre presentations, which, is, which betrays that he doesn't have his heart in it, because as a former Leader of the House, he well knows that on any fair reading of the standing orders, Mr Speaker, the ruling that you gave Remember was entirely, entirely consistent with many previous rulings by uh, uh, speakers in this house well no I will answer the question I will answer that question in some uh, in some detail but let me let me just uh, before I go to the technical argument say mr. speaker you acted fairly you acted properly and furthermore you acted consistently during question time and uh, uh, it is uh, it says a lot about this opposition. They don't even understand how to use the standing orders to run an attack on a government minister. Now, Mr. Speaker, uh, my uh, uh, understanding of the question is now it's interesting that neither of the two speakers on the other side actually stood up in the House and repeated the question. Didn't repeat the question. And in fact, I read over. I read. I, I lent over the. I lent over the uh, bar table during the uh, debate, and I said, "Would you bar table?" And I said. Would you give me a Lord. copy of the question? Would you give me a copy of the question? Oh no, we're not going to give you a copy of the question. And I tell you why you wouldn't want to give us a copy of the question, and that is because when you read it, it's so obvious how so out of order it was. This is the question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question again is to the Minister for Small Business and Consumer Affairs. Has the Minister made any approach to or had contact with? No, no, no. Oh, now this, I love this. I love this. Order. I love this. Order. I love this. You know, they, as soon as I start to read out the question, it's immediately obvious to them now that it left out a couple of words, so they're trying to put them in by interjection. I mean, talk about CJO, CJO. Now, I will read it out. I will read it out. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question again is to the Minister for Small Business and Consumer Affairs. Has the Minister made any approach to or had contact with any director of Colesmire or with Western Australian planning ministers, both past or present, or their departments, in regard to any business in which he has a financial interest? That was the question. Now, why is that uh, question uh, clearly defective and therefore why is your ruling uh, clearly uh, should, why should it be supported by the House? Well, firstly, Mr. Speaker, the first and obvious thing to say about this question is uh, that uh, it is not an issue, it does not raise an issue of whether the minister can be asked questions about conflict of interest. In other words, it does not go to conflict of interest per se on the face of the question. It, no, no, you left the words out. Listen, you know, your tactics committee is going to have to sort of get up earlier and think a bit harder about its questions. Uh, you left that out. The second thing is that. that that you made no, apart from the apart from the fact that you referred to the minister, you know, minister, this is the question for you. Apart from that, there was no nexus with the minister's ministerial duties. No nexus with, on the face of the question, as as a as clearly on the face of the question, no direct nexus, no nexus with the minister's duties whatsoever. In fact, in fact, Mr. Speaker. Not only was there no direct reference, when you look at the last words of the question in regard to any business in which he has a financial interest, in fact those words qualify the question and limit it to personal business matters only. In other words, nothing to do with his ministerial responsibilities. Now, Mr Speaker, what are the rules? Those are the facts. Those are the facts. What are the rules? Well, the rules on this, the rules on this are very, very clear. If, you, if I direct members to House of Reps practice. Uh, page 509 on questions. This is what it says. The underlying principle is that ministers are required to answer questions only on matters for which they are responsible to the parliament. Consequently, speakers have ruled out of order questions to ministers which concern, for example, a number of examples are given, statements, actions or decisions of the minister's own party or of its conferences or officials or of those of other parties, including opposition parties. Well, it's not that one. Um, statements by people outside the House, including other members, notably opposition members. No, not that one. Not that one. No. Um, statements in the House by other members. No, not that one. 
No, it's it's all the practice barracking for the bombers, and we're getting a bit hoarse in the throat this year. Uh, but you know, I tell you, there. And how did the bombers go against North Melbourne? That's a very good question. Now, as a matter of fact, Mr. Speaker, that's a question that would be in order, provided it was properly uh, in a nexus Sorry, to the minister's uh, ministerial responsibilities. Uh, then uh, the other one is, and this is uh, just to uh, keep people's attention on the issue. Consequently, speakers have ruled out of order questions to ministers which concern, for example, anything of. Order. I'll, I'll read it slowly for you, Simon. I'll read it slowly, Member for slowly and clearly. Anything of a private nature that is not related to the public duties of a minister. Now, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, uh, I had an interjection before which said, "Oh, you know, has anybody ever made such a ruling before?" For heaven's sakes, read the House of Reps practice. It's there in black and white. There in black and white, you had no nexus, nothing to do with his ministerial responsibilities, and the question and the question was clearly to the financial for, personal hey. interest of the minister. Uh, let me say, uh, go on and say, because this is an interesting little point that uh, comes up in the House of Reps practice. They say, as mentioned in the cases above, it's not in order for the personal conduct or private affairs of a minister to be criticised by way of a question. A charge of a personal nature can only be raised by way of a direct and substantive motion. This fundamental parliamentary rule was reiterated by Speaker Snedden, and he then goes on to give the quote. Now, so there's another sort of clue in this about the tactics, you see, because we had a number of questions on this issue yesterday, and we sit here on the front bench and we're saying we get notes from our colleagues saying, you know, what's going to happen next? Are they going to do this? Are they going to do that? And, and what was clear at the end of question time yesterday that they didn't have enough for a censure motion. So we got no censure motion. What we got today was in the tactics meeting. Now you see, so admission, admission, admission out of your tactics committee. No, nothing, nothing to run for a censure motion. And then today they pick up the papers. They see the Australian editorial and they say, "Oh, whippy, we'll give it another run." Do they run a censure motion? Oh no, oh no. In fact, they, they must. I would say, Mr. Speaker, I would say, Mr. Speaker, I would say that in their tactics meeting this morning, the view would have been that it's quite clear that they didn't have enough to run on a censure. The opportunity was provided today, an excuse used. You didn't have anything for a censure motion. So what do you think you do? You're going to run an attack on the Speaker. Run an attack on the Speaker on the basis of a, of a ruling which has, is as clear, as clear a ruling within the standing orders as I have ever seen in the whole time that I've been in this parliament. Now, Mr Speaker, uh, Mr. Speaker uh, the fact of the matter is there is no substantive motion. The fact of the matter is that if you hadn't been so uh, uh, impatient, you would have been able to ask that question to the minister if you had properly worded it. I mean that is the position. That is the position. The member for Kalgoorlie, what an embarrassment he's been to you over the years. But what an acute embarrassment he was when he today asked the speaker a question on a uh, basically on a point of order in which it said, well, if the question had been properly drafted, Mr. Speaker, would you have allowed? The question to have been asked and therefore required it to be answered. And what did you say, Mr. Speaker? Perhaps uh, uh, not uh, in any way attempting to uh, involve you in this debate, Mr. Speaker. Uh, that would be improper to do so. But, Mr. Speaker, knowing you well, uh, knowing you well, in your response, uh, the, uh, the sense of uh, accommodation you are prepared to afford the member for Kalgoorlie makes it quite clear, Mr. Speaker, you actually do know about what the standing orders mean when it comes to questions of this sort. And, uh, Mr. Speaker, you had no hesitation in ruling the question out of order. You'd been considering the issues because the right honourable member for New England had put the issue to you quite uh, squarely in the previous question. Uh, you had clearly had it in your mind that this was an issue that you might have to address during question time today. I thought, I thought in respect, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, without canvassing uh, your views, but I did think that it was an option for you in response to the member for New England to in fact say, well, part of the question was in order and part of it was out of order. But you, in your wisdom, Mr. Speaker, you said, no, the question was fair enough. We accepted that. We accepted that ruling. We accepted that ruling. Uh, that, was, uh, that was in the hurly burly, Mr. Speaker, of, uh, uh, of the House. You have discretion. You have a discretion. 
in the uh, handling of these matters. You exercised the discretion in what you believed was a manner fair and consistent with the standing orders and reasonable in all the circumstances for the, matter to have, uh, for the House to have these matters properly before it. Uh, so on that matter, Mr Speaker, we accepted your ruling. There was I wasn't up on my feet saying, oh, you know, the second part's out of order. You ought to support the member for New England. None of this nonsense. Why wasn't I? Because the minister was more than happy to answer the question. He's got nothing to hide. He's, got, he's, been, he's, he's, complied, he's complied with the ministerial uh, uh, requirements. He's, uh, he's complied with the requirements of disclosure. We've had a lot of talk about this uh, disclosure of the ministers, uh, which says apparently—I haven't even read the thing, but what does it say? Bunbury— uh, Various lots. That's in his own personal name. And the, the other allegation is, is that he didn't list certain properties, but those properties were held by the company. There's no requirement for him to go into the assets of the company of which he is a proprietor. And I tell you what, if there was, we would have had the piggery. We would have had the piggery. Every last little piglet would have been on the disclosure <laughs> form. Uh, was that the requirement then? No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. So old CJO, he's putting up a new form of. Uh, of pecuniary interest declaration, which of course he wants now but never wanted when the piglets were in charge. So, Mr. Speaker, uh, uh, we, re we reject this. Well, we reject this uh, on uh, we reject this on a very uh, uh, substantial basis, and that is, this is a motion to dissent from your ruling, uh, Mr. Speaker. We don't like all of your rulings. Let me say we don't like them all, and we would be dishonest if we said anything otherwise. Uh, but, Mr Speaker, if I couldn't say that, then you wouldn't be an independent speaker. Uh, uh, the fact of the matter is, Mr Speaker, you exercise your discretion. Uh, you do so in conformity with the standing orders and on an independent basis. And you've done so, you've done so today. You've done so today. And as I've, just, as I've shown, Mr Speaker, as a matter of logic, as a matter of precedent, as a matter of common sense, as a matter of consistency, in every possible way, the ruling that you gave, Mr. Speaker, uh, was entirely a correct order. On that basis, uh, we have no hesitation in rejecting this motion of dissent, and we reject, we reject the, the, this opposition that has used this motion as a means to attack one of, uh, one, an excellent minister, a person who has done a first-class job Order. as the Minister the for Small Honourable Business. The Minister's time has expired. The question is that the motion be agreed to the Honourable— Mr Speaker, I support the dispent motion because Hoss what you have ruled out as the Speaker you allowed in as whip. Put. The question is that the motion be put. All those in favour say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. No, it's have it. Division? Division required. Ring the bell.
toga. You got, a, you got about a minute. Order, lock the doors. The question is that the motion be put. The ayes will move to the right of the chamber, the noes to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Caragamite, Adelaide and Riverina for the ayes and the honourable members for Fowler, Meribanong and Bruce for the noes.
Order. The result of the division is eyes 86, nose 43. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. The question now is that the Speaker's ruling be dissented from. All those in favour say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. I think the noes have it. Ayes have it. Division. Division required. Ring the bell for one minute. I appoint the honourable members for Fowler. Oh, no. okay. Order. Lock the doors. The question is that the Speaker's ruling be dissented from. I appoint the honourable members for Fowler, Meribinong and Bruce for the ayes, the honourable members for Caragamite, Adelaide and Riverina for the noes.
Order. The result of the division is eyes 43, noes 87. The resolution is therefore resolved in the negative. Would members quickly and quietly resume their places or remove themselves from the chamber forthwith? The Ask the further question to be placed on the notice paper. Oh,